Yeah. So we're going to talk about morals. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to do this show because we've been getting a lot of um, emails and comments on the blog um, about um, you know theists coming in and talking to us about atheists and morals. Right. And the old atheist claim was that, well, there can be no morality without God. And, you know, uh, theists generally don't believe in, well, some of them don't believe in evolution, but ironically enough, their claims have evolved. Right. And so the new claim is, okay, we agree you guys have morals, but you don't know why you have morals. You have no objective reference for right and wrong. Therefore, it's just based on your preference, and you could change your mind tomorrow. Yeah, and there's a, a kind of a side claim with this. Um, Paul in, in Romans talks about how uh, God has written his moral code into the heart of everybody. So when I had a conversation with uh, relatives, um, I was expecting the, well, you're atheist, so you're immoral. You have no morals. Mm -hmm. And instead they said, no, 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 you, you're moral. And it's because God told you how to be moral. Yeah. You just don't realize Yes. It. Yes, that's the other assertion is that... Funny okay, that I disagree you, with him so often. Yeah, if, if, if you do have some claim to uh, some objective moral sense, it's because you borrowed it from Christianity. Right. So, uh, the, you know, their, their assertion is that um, God and their specific God is the source of morality. And without this, we don't have any objective basis for that. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today was... How do, how do we develop the ability to make moral judgments? Uh, where does that come from? And in short, it, it has nothing to do with religion. Um, it's, a, it's really a product of, um, of evolution, our, abil our ability to reason. Uh, but it's a little more than that. So before we get into that, I want to go through some definitions. Okay. Um, first of all, you know, when we say morals, what do we mean by that? Um, well, really, the morals are the principles of behavior that um, are based on our concepts of right and wrong. Um, and then somet sometimes we talk about ethics in relation to morals. Right. Um, ethics refers to um, a system of rules um, that we follow that where we've uh, attributed values to behaviors um, by judging them good or bad according to either their intrinsic moral qualities or uh, concrete social consequences. So. Um, there's a little bit of a difference there. Morals are the actual behaviors, and ethics is the system of rules that we follow to, that we um, use to, to judge whether something's good or bad. Um, now, there's another concept I want to talk about, which is empathy. Um, empathy is uh, basically the identification with and understanding of another person's situation. Um, essentially, the ability to put yourself in someone else's um, psychological frame of reference. Right. So you can understand their feelings, their actions, their motives, and, and then those become somewhat predictable. Okay. So where do we get our morals? Well, the short answer is they're a gift from our parents. And um, I'm not going to go through um, a lot of the, the basis behind um, the idea that uh, um, altruism uh, is something that evolved because I think other people have covered that pretty well in previous shows. But I'll just say that, um, as I mentioned before, it's a product of our ability to reason, um, which is itself a product of evolution. So it, it's in the genes. Um, but it's more than that. Um, we, we all know that genes confer only potential. So just because you have a genetic ability to do something doesn't mean that ability is going to manifest. And this is particularly true when we talk about any kind of... Um, um, you know, behavioral attribute like moral judgment or other aspects of personality, your sense of humor, things like that. It also is a, a byproduct of parenting skills um, and also brain development. So when we talk about, um, <coughs> you know, how do we know that a child is on the path to developing good moral judgment? Well, you can look at um, an infant. Uh, the first outward manifestation of empathy occurs at around 10 months. And so you'll have a 10-month-old child sitting in a high chair happily eating Cheerios, and then they offer you one because for the first time they understand that you might be hungry too. Right. So they're going to give you one of the Cheerios. And the interesting thing about this is that um, people noticed this a long time ago, but they didn't put it together with what's going on in a kid's brain at that time. Uh, what's happening is... Um, the ability to use a specific part of your brain as you're growing through infancy depends on uh, developing a myelin sheath, 
around those nerves. And so what's happening is myelination of the frontal cortex, which is where our higher centers of reasoning originate. So that's what's happening at around 10 months. It actually starts around eight months. And so enough myelination has occurred at around 10 months for the child to exhibit empathy. So that's, there's a neurobiological basis for it, as well as um, a psychological basis that's based on a parental bond. So, so we've got genetics, parenting, brain development. And so the other thing that happens is as children grow through um, you know, young childhood, um, they naturally develop a, a strong desire to please their parents. And that desire to please their parents uh, provides a very powerful incentive to adopt their parents' system of values. So parents then are transmitting their personal values to the children by the way they parent them. Now, we know that this moral development can be derailed by neglect and abuse. Right. And we see this in cases of reactive attachment disorder, where something happens to disrupt the parental bond, usually in infancy, but um, most certainly in the first five years of a child's life. And it can be neglectful parenting, and it can be an abusive environment. Um, it could be something as simple as um, chronic pain that's, that the, child, the parent is either um, unable or unwilling to take care of. And an example that's given for that is like a chronic undiagnosed ear infection. Mm -hmm. Um, which is kind of scary when you think about, you know, um, how often kids can get ear infections. Um, the difference is that this is something that goes on and causes the child chronic pain, and the parent either is not aware that that's going on or, you know, they, they for whatever reason, don't address it. So that can produce reactive attachment disorder, and in this case, a child doesn't develop empathy. So they have no means of of putting themselves in another person's shoes and understanding another person's point of view. So, so ear infections breed sociopaths? No. Okay. <laughs> just wanted to see how far we were going to extend that. No, no, that's just one example that was given, and, and, and I'm sure that that doesn't happen very often. But, but another thing that can disrupt that parental bond actually is uh, some kind of chronic illness in childhood, like mm -hmm. cancer that involves a lot of painful treatments. And in that case, the, the parent really would be pretty powerless to intervene in that. Um, and so that could actually produce a re, uh, some type of attachment disorder. And, and I would suppose that just crappy, neglectful parents. Yes, that's the most probably often. Probably the biggest one. Yeah, that's the most often, most often the cause of this attachment disorder. So um, my guess is if you looked at the prison population, most of them had parents who were either uh, poor parents for you know because they were too young or they were addicted to drugs or you know they were just jerks maybe they were the victims of poor parenting themselves so. um, now the interesting thing about this is that there's a straw man that's often put up there by some theists that come around to debate us that talk about um, you know uh, you don't know you don't understand why um, something is good or bad and this sort of straw man that they construct of, of atheist morality sounds a lot like a kid that has uh, reactive attachment disorder. Because they're saying, yeah, you follow the rules, but you don't know why the rules exist. Which actually is a good description of a kid with attachment disorder, because often they can follow the rules. They know rules exist, but they don't know why. Right. And they, since they don't have any empathy for someone, um, they can't, can't um, put themselves in another's shoes. Uh, so I just want to point that out, that there, there's like this straw man that, that some of the theists we deal with construct uh, in order to, to uh, justify that you know, we have to turn to their version of Christianity in order to, to be good. Okay. So um, next I want to talk about a little bit about moral judgment, um, how it develops and matures over time, because no one's born uh, knowing how to make a moral judgment. Um, in fact, uh, this, it, it starts with this genetic potential. Um, parents nurture it in, throughout childhood, and biology plays a role here. Um, but then the other thing that happens is kids actually have to practice making decisions yeah. and making moral judgments. It's, a, it's a, a thought process. And when you're talking about earlier on with, with the genetics and the potential, what we're talking about is the potential for reasoning abilities and, right. you know, judgment issues, um, empathy, 
those types of things, I mean, it, certainly you could have, you could be genetically predisposed to not be particularly empathic or caring. Right. Um, those, and those are the factors that lead, no, she, nobody's implying that um, there's some genetic code for right and wrong. These are the, no. these are the things that allow us to build up the, the moral right. systems. Right, yeah, you don't, you don't have a genetic set of rules that come down you know, through your DNA. Right. Um, and in fact, morality is culturally determined. That's one thing that, that I think some of the theists don't seem to get. It is culturally determined. And it changes. Yes, it does. And that's okay. Um, but there are, uh, there are a couple of uh, child psychologists I wanted to bring up uh, here that, that studied moral development um, that I think made a, a fairly significant contribution uh, to our understanding of it. And, and this is by no means the final word, so if anybody out there is a psychologist and they want to critique me on this, um, I will accept constructive criticism, but I am not claiming that, the, that either of these are the final word. Um, the first of these is uh, Jean Piaget, who's a Swiss psychologist who did a lot of work with uh, child development. So he's got a foreign name, so he must be an authority. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but anyway, Piaget um, developed a two-stage model of moral development because he noticed that young children make moral decisions in a certain way, and then older children consider them in a different way. And essentially, um, the younger children believe that rules exist as fixed entities. They're handed down by some authority, and you can't change them. Okay? Uh, whereas older children understands, understand that rules are not absolute, and that we can change them if everyone agrees. So his dividing line between you know, when a child's uh, moral sense changes was around 10 or 11. And the interesting thing that's happening in your brain, uh, starting from when you're about eight years old and continuing well into your teen years, is that um, the brain of a small child has a lot of neurons. And starting at about eight years old, you begin a process of pruning the synapses. And so you're pruning basically things you're not using. So your brain becomes much more efficient. And as a consequence of this, um, you also develop higher reasoning capabilities. Uh, and it, it actually, this, uh, this sort of uh, brain development uh, doesn't end at 10 or 11 or whatever. Like I said, it continues well right. into adolescence with the, the pruning. Um, but development of the ability to make moral judgments continues pretty much for your whole life as you gain. And that's a good thing. Yes, it is. Because, you know, and not to derail the conversation, at, at some point um, after 25 plus years of being a Christian and accepting those moral precepts, uh, my world changed. Mm -hmm. I s stopped believing uh, in the Christian God and then eventually in, in any concept of God. And the, one of the first things that I had to do was consider this moral question, reevaluate what my positions were on nearly everything um, you know, granted once you make a decision about one thing some some others naturally follow but I had to reevaluate it and say okay if um, if if you know my previous position was uh, murder is wrong because God said it's wrong um, then I need to figure out is murder actually wrong and why and basically you know I had to follow that path down so it's good uh, critical I'd say that we're able to actually reconsider uh, those moral questions, as, yes. even as we get older. Otherwise, yes. I'd still be going to church. Yeah. I would have had to get up much earlier today. <laughs> yeah, because you'd probably been the minister, so you'd have been up preparing your sermon. I'd have been out drinking and partying. <laughs> <laughs> See, if I, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to you ministers who don't drink and party. But anyway, go ahead. So this, uh, PSA um, did his work in the 1930s. Um, later on, there was a guy named Lawrence Kohlberg who looked at Piaget's work and he said, yeah, you know, I, I basically agree with this, but I think it's a little more complicated than that. So Kohlberg developed this theory of, of moral development that included six stages. And so he divided these six stages into three levels. So we have level one, which is pre-conventional morality. Um, and in this stage, children don't even see themselves as members of society. They think in terms of very, uh, you know, a very individual perspective. Uh, <coughs> level two is conventional morality. That's where uh, children first begin to see themselves as members of society. 
And then there's post-conventional morality, uh, where we get into um, not only what's good for most people, but you know underlying principles that we use to define right. um, how we arrive at, at a just uh, solution. So starting with level one, we, we have stage one, which is what we call the obedience and punishment phase. And it, it's very interesting because I, I have a, a, a three-year-old son, and if you ask him why something's wrong, He'd probably tell you because you get in trouble if you do it. So children in, at this stage see things as it's wrong if you get punished, and if you don't get punished, it's not wrong. So it's a very simple way of looking at things. Um, later, they move on to stage two, which is individualism and exchange. So they understand that the rules aren't fixed anymore. Uh, there's still an emphasis on punishment, but that's an understanding that you need to avoid that. Um, but they, they, they focus on whether something's fair or unfair. So if, if uh, something's unfair, then it must be wrong. And, and so you're allowed to break a rule if you perceive it as unfair. And um, it, I guess uh, I should point out that one of the, the, um, the things that Kohlberg used um, as one of his moral dilemmas um, he would tell people the story of um, a guy named Hines um, whose wife had some kind of cancer and needed a special drug. And there was a pharmacist who had developed the very treatment that she needed. So in order to uh, obtain that drug, Hines had to purchase it from this specific pharmacist. Now this pharmacist, um, he was able to buy the materials to make the drug for only $200, but he charged $2,000 a dose for this drug. And so um, Heinz could only raise half the money, even though he tried borrowing from friends and everyone. And so he went to the drug, to the, uh, the drug store and he offered the pharmacist the $1,000 that he had for the drug, and the pharmacist refused. And so later, Heinz broke into the pharmacy and stole the drug. So Kohlberg's question was, was Heinz right or wrong to steal the drug? Okay, so, um, you know, someone in stage one, um, a kid would say, oh no, stealing's wrong, it's a rule, you can't do it. Stage two, a child would probably say, well, the, the pharmacist was being unfair, so it was okay for Heinz to steal the drug. Um, and so that that's an illustration of how kids it in level one, pre-conventional morality make decisions. In one case, very fixed and defined, you know, it's a rule so you can't break it. The second thing is, um, you know, if it's unfair, it's okay to break the rule. So then we move from there to conventional morality. Um, and in conventional morality, we have an emphasis on good interpersonal relationships. So children at this stage are usually uh, it's just before they enter their teens. Um, stage three, uh, the first three stages roughly correspond to Piaget's um, earlier stage in right. moral development. So children at this age uh, focus on motives. So if someone's motives were good, then um, you have to consider that uh, in determining whether their behavior is bad. So in that case, they may say that Heinz didn't do anything wrong because his motives were about you know, helping his wife. And, and so um, he wasn't wrong. Or they may say, well, the pharmacist, um, he was just being mean. So he had bad motives. Therefore, it's okay that he had the drug stolen from him. So, you know, in this case, um, you know, very, very uh, um, more nuanced approach uh, to making moral decisions. Okay. And then... Stage four is uh, what we call the law and order stage. Um, and for the first time now, uh, the concern is, is for uh, society as a whole as opposed to just how we handle interpersonal conflicts. Right. And so now um, people who are usually well into their teens finally understand the function of laws in helping society sm function smoothly. So... Um, Actually, most people um, in the world will stop at stage four and go no further. And in fact, in primitive cultures, 
it's unusual to see someone advance past stage three, simply because in very primitive like tribal cultures, there's not a lot of dilemmas that challenge stage right. three morality. You've got smaller societies, family units, things like that. You don't have to deal with you know the com complexities, and a lot of times um, the well throughout history, both with the family units and with the church, mm -hmm. um, you have a dogmatic authority that yes. decides for you what's right and wrong, and there's just no opportunity to question it. And the situations that arise that would challenge it, um, you know, the, the authorities already have the power mm -hmm. and tend to squelch it. So it took a lot of kind of um, free-thinking, rebellious people to continually challenge uh, those things in order to even get us to the point where we could get to stage four. Yes. And um, oh, there's another point I was going to make about this stuff, and now I lost it. Okay. We'll, we'll just go into post-conventional morality. I'll come back to that in a minute. Post-conventional morality uh, moves on to um, stage five, where we have a social contract and individual rights. And in this this stage, there's a recognition that different groups in society can have um, different values, but that certain basic rights need to be protected. And that if we're going to make a change, there's got to be a democratic process that we use to make those changes. So uh, the focus here is on creating some kind of smoothly functioning society right. that's based on this concept of certain basic rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, for example. So there's that. And then finally we get to stage six, which is about universal principles. Um, and these are the, in this stage is, it defines the principles that we use to achieve justice. And in this case, um, we, we define justice as, as something that's based on equal respect for everyone. An example of this would be um, a, a majority would not get to vote on restricting the rights of a minority. Right. And If you all got together and decided you wanted to enslave the atheists, um, yeah, you know, we've already set up a system where you know your your rights don't include the violation of ours. Yeah, and I guess um, my uh, analogy here is that um, if you get to stage five or, or even up in stage four, um, four or five, and your your focus is on a smoothly functioning society, well, a smoothly functioning society is not necessarily a just society. Right. So, for example, Nazi Germany was very smoothly functioning. Yeah. But no one would argue that that was a just um, framework for you anything. Can, you can have a you can have a society that operates very efficiently, cleanly, and has no real regard for individual human rights. Right. So the post-conventional morality, and, and in particular stage six, um, concerns itself with making sure that uh, we not only have a smoothly functioning society, but we have the underlying principles that take into account um, each person's. Uh, point of view in that, so that, and, and I guess my uh, um, my analogy that I would use here is that is how our court system functions with, when reviewing whether a law is considered constitutional or not. Right. So we can, uh, you know, the justice system can overturn a law that, uh, for example, like you said, if we voted to enslave a certain group of people. Um, the Supreme Court, it wouldn't even get to the Supreme Court because our our courts would overturn that instantly. Yeah, I would hope instantly. that we're relatively sane. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much more you have. We've got about 25 minutes left. Okay. Yeah, I was just uh, going to point out that um, it, it really she brought up a good point that it, it, in the case you have any, any um, um, belief system or whatever that claims access to some absolute truth, mm -hmm. you should automatically be skeptical of that yeah. and challenge that. And in particular, um, we have um, theists who claim that the Bible is a source of absolute morality or you know, some objective standard of morality. And I'd like to point and out before somebody calls in and says it, science doesn't assert absolute truth. Right. Every bit of knowledge that we have in, in, in science that's, that's good science is all tentative. Yeah. As soon as the evidence forces us to change our understanding, we change our understanding. It's the only responsible thing to do. It doesn't yes. make science unreliable. It's what makes science reliable. Well, I, one of the things I wanted to bring up is that we've gotten in a lot of email lately about um, the Bible uh, doesn't condone slavery, even though there are clearly some passages that 
Um, do. They, they give you specific instructions on how to um, enslave people in the biblically correct way. And so a lot of the responses we get when we point this out to theists is that, oh, well, that's not God condoning slavery. Um, he just allows it. Well, they give me a definition of allows versus condones. And how do you work the instructions in there? Yeah. But um, the other thing is that, you know, the, the best one I saw lately was um, from the guy that emailed us. And he said, well, um, you don't understand the, the history and culture of the ancient Near East. And that was just part of their economic model there or whatever, you know, it, it yeah. slavery. And it's like, okay, what this guy just described was an example of cultural relativism, moral relativism. It's, it's culturally defined. Slavery was okay. Now, if God is a, a standard of absolute morality, why didn't he condemn slavery at that point and tell him, okay, no more slaves ever, yeah. end, of, end of story. But he didn't do that. He gave him instructions for how to do it properly. And so it took secular morality. And by the way, those instructions say that you can beat them as long as you don't beat them to death. Right. Everything short of death is okay with your God. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, you got to be careful, though, because the rules for who you enslave uh, are differ, and you're not supposed to enslave your fellow Jew, but if you do, um, you have to let him go after seven <laughs> years, unless you con him by getting him married, and then he comes and says, hey, I really love my wife, um, uh, I'd rather not leave, and, and if he says that, then now he's yours forever, and you take and you hold his ear up to the door and drive and all, I mean, you know, it's, it's good slavery like that that your Bible supports. Yeah, so, so it took secular morality uh, for us to realize that, hey, owning other humans is probably not the most moral thing you can do. Um, so just wanted to point that out. That Which is why when I continually point out that I am more moral than the God of the Bible, I'm not just using my own you know, relative morals to make that determination. Anybody can say that. I'm saying that by sane, social, conventional standards of morality, I am more moral than the God in the in the Old Testament. And actually, I'd say I'm more moral than the one in the New Testament, too. But, you know, I can't really comment. Oh, wait, we lost a caller. Joanne was calling to tell us that God loves us. And as soon as I mentioned that, uh, you know, I'm more moral than her God, <laughs> evidently, maybe he doesn't love us anymore. So we'll, we'll drop that line. But... Um, you, before we, yeah, before we go on, I, I, I want to just uh, make the last point here in, in that um, in, in, I just covered Piaget's theory and Kohlberg's theory on the stages of moral development. Uh, there have been a lot of other people that have contributed to this. Uh, the one thing that's noticeably absent as a requirement for moral development is any reliance on religion or God. So my point here is that uh, religion or a notion of God adds about the same amount to moral development as it does to evolution, which is nothing. Or soup. Exactly. Stone soup. There you go. Yeah. We bring Tracy up so much. Yeah, you know, the stone I know. Soup. By the way, the Wile E. Coyote thing, that was originally from Tracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I loved it. And so I'm going to use it whenever I can. But.